Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Institutional Research for Military Connected Student Success, brought to you in partnership by the Multistate Collaborative on Military Credit and the Association for Institutional Research. My name is Sarah Appel, and I'm the manager for the Multistate Collaborative on Military Credit, which is an initiative of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. A couple of housekeeping uh, rules or questions. Please submit those through the chat feature in the left hand side and follow what we done as we go through the presentation. We couldn't do the work that we do without special thanks to Lumina and to Strat Education Network uh, for the generous grants they have given us over the last few years. A brief overview about MCMC. Uh, the mission of the Multi-State Collaborative is to facilitate an interstate partnership of 13 states and to translate competencies acquired by veterans through military training and experiences toward college credentials. States exchange information and they share best practices in the areas of articulation of credit, certification and licensure, communication and data and technology. Our project goals are to assist student veterans with completing post-secondary education and the transition into civilian employment. MCMC has established the following three goals that support that main goal I just mentioned. Uh, we assist states and post-secondary institutions in aiding military-connected students with critical life transitions from the military to post-secondary education and then from post-secondary education to civilian employment. We also work to increase post-secondary education completion rates by creating models for the consistent, transparent, and effective awarding of credit for military training and experience that can be scaled regionally and nationally, thereby lowering the cost of education and reducing the time to completion. Establish a strong network of support, communication, documentation, and data collection among institutions and organizations for the purpose of promoting shared interests and tracking the efficacy of efforts to enhance military-connected students' educational success. Uh, we do this work um, through four knowledge communities. We have the articulation of academic credit, communication and outreach, data systems and technology, and licensure and certification. Today's presenters, we're happy to have with us Rachel Boone, who's the Chief Academic Officer, Board of Regents, State of Iowa, David Johnson, who's the Senior Associate Registrar at the University of Iowa, and Jeremy Kinzel, who's Director of Data and Research Services at the Missouri Department of Higher Education. Uh, one of our major collaborators at, collaborators at the Association for Institutional Research is Gina Johnson. She is the Assistant Executive Director for Partnerships and Membership. Unfortunately, Gina will not be able to be with us today, but she did have some slides and some words she would like for me to share with you. Institutional research, defined as data, information, and analysis for decision support, has been rapidly evolving the past few years. This quotation by Mark Udall nicely sums up the view of AIR that in higher education, the need to be intentional about our decisions and data, information, and analysis can help us get there. You don't climb mountains without a team. You don't climb mountains without being fit. You don't climb mountains without being prepared. And you don't climb mountains without balancing the risks and the rewards. And you never climb a mountain on accident. It has to be intentional. As part of the evolution of institutional research, AIR has defined a set of duties and functions that must be present in an institution or system of higher education for it to successfully conduct institutional research. IR professionals work collectively with colleagues and units such as IT, registrar's office, enrollment management, student services, finance, and others to ensure successful completion of these duties. IR professionals also take a leading role in ensuring these duties and functions are done well. This evolution and clarification of the duties and functions of institutional research has allowed those in higher education to better collect and analyze data to inform decisions related to specific subsets of students and stakeholders. 
relevant to this presentation, military-connected students are an increasingly important constituency to consider. The speakers to follow will share their experiences in collecting and analyzing data and using this information to improve the success of this very important group of students. So next, I would like to turn it over to David Johnson at the University of Iowa. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to talk to you first about uh, engaging these students, right? I mean, in order for you to collect the data and in order for you to make use of the data, you actually, you actually have to engage the student right off the bat. So one of the things that the University of Iowa has done is right on our online application process, we have a checkbox for these applicants, and it basically asks them if they are a veteran or if they are a dependent of a veteran. And that checkbox allows us to identify these students so that if and when they decide to come to the university, we can track them. And one of the first things that we do through our orientation process is all of the students that have this flag on their uh, record, we bring them into a specific orientation class for military-related students. And um, we give them basically the, what the University of Iowa has to offer for them and uh, how we can go about laying out this uh, program to make it work effectively for their academic career. The other thing that we hey, do David? is we, yes. David, I'm sorry, this is Sarah. We've had a couple of folks um, chime in that they weren't able to hear you very well. Could you speak up just a little bit? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Things, Appreciate it. You bet. One of the things that we have started at the University of Iowa is a course specifically for these targeted students. And we run the course one week before the actual fall semester starts. And this is called the Military to Civilian Career Exploration Class. Now, we're fortunate enough that we have uh, what we call the Lakeside Labs, which is up in Lake Okoboji, Iowa. And they have these cabins that were built in the 30s and the 20s. And we can take these students up there as an outing. And uh, it does several things. Uh, but the most important thing is it allows them to build relationships with each other so that they can feel like they're part of a group. The second thing that it does is it allows us to introduce to them all of the benefits uh, and resources that we have on campus to help them get through. And the third thing that it does is it helps uh, them right off the bat formulate their academic career into transferring over into uh, once you've graduated, now I've got to go into the job market. And it is this training process uh, that does that. So it gives them a good foundation for the start of the University of Iowa. Now, once you've proceeded on to that, I like to look at data in terms of not just somebody looking at pie charts at the end of the year saying, well, this was kind of a nice trend and that was kind of a nice trend. I actually like to use the data at Iowa dynamically on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we've done is we've created several reports that are based on the students that we have flagged. And uh, these reports help us in our day-to-day -day work. On the screen right now, you can see a list of some of these reports that we are uh, using. But I'll go into specifics here. For instance, this is a report uh, right over here that creates <coughs> Uh, a list of students that may be in need during the midterm. So what happens is it will scan through our database, and any of these students that are getting uh, a grade of less than a D plus or below, it flags them, and that brings it up. That way we can reach out to these veterans uh, before too much longer so that we can get them the help they need, whether they need to have uh, uh, tutorial assistance or whether or not they actually need to drop that course. We want to grab these uh, problems before they come an irreconcilable problem. So this report has come in extremely handy. Another report that we do is track our own progress. You know, a lot of these students uh, are surviving on the benefits that they get through the VA. And if we don't do our part on our end, they don't get paid. They don't get to eat. They don't get to pay for the roof over their head. So we have this report that tells us whether or not we've done our paperwork to ensure that they've been certified for the correct amount of hours that they're actually taking. And this is updated on a daily basis. So 
if a student were to add credits or if they were to decrease credits dynamically, we would know that. and We can go right into the system and change the so that it decreases the amount of delays from the VA's response. And this last report that I want to show you will track the student's actions, whether or not they've uh, decided to drop a class or withdraw a class and they haven't told us or they haven't told their advisor. This report will tip us off and it will uh, help us get the assistance to that student that they need. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the I'm sorry, about the philosophy. We we try to make sure that the data that we create and uh, collect on these students is useful in the immediate as well as the long term. And uh, I think when you do that, you start to see the benefits right away. You don't have to wait six months down the road to uh, an analyze your data. So at this point, I guess I will turn it over to Missouri. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Jeremy here. This is uh, Jeremy Kinsel. I'm the uh, Director of Data and Research Services for the Missouri Department of Higher Education. And I think what I'd like to do today is to just come at it a little bit from, a, uh, from an IR research perspective as well. Um, we, uh, we have been, uh, I think, uh, you know, longstanding uh, even founding members, I think, of the uh, Missouri Collaborative on uh, Military Credit through uh, MEC and through their leadership, they've really led us to to think and to, kind of to some introspection about what we did and didn't know and were and weren't able to uh, to say about the progress of veterans in higher education in our state. And I think through that and through those conversations, I you know I've been there were growing questions, as I said, in recent years about uh, veterans' presence and success in higher education, what we knew. We had little data to uh, track their progress. Um, veteran and active duty status were reported in the FAFSA, and we've had access to that and could uh, do some basic research and, and analysis with that. But, uh, you know, veterans weren't required to, as I understood it, to file a FAFSA to claim their post-9-11 GI benefits. So if that's the only mechanism you have for identifying them from a uh, data analysis perspective, you're going to miss a, a pretty healthy population. Um, healthy meaning just large, uh, significant, I think, I believe. So we began talking uh, early in 2016, I think, about how and where we might be able to collect additional data in, in our existing student level data. We've got something in Missouri called the MSAS uh, uh, system. And MSAS is Enhanced Missouri Student Achievement Study, and that's just an umbrella term for the record level data that we collect and have collected for uh, uh, some years, even decades, from the public institutions in the state and over the course of the last few years from, uh, from, from a handful of participating uh, private independent institutions for which we are, uh, we are very grateful. We've got uh, fall enrollment data, we've got year-end uh, uh, completions data, and some end-of-term registration data that tells us some things about uh, about uh, uh, credits completed by term, about GPA by term, so we can track these students uh, uh, longitudinally through their uh, career in higher education at these institutions. So back to 2016, we began having discussions in the spring and the summer after our, uh, our collection season had ended. And we eventually came to some uh, consensus that we should add to our collections. We, uh, you know, we, you know, the institutions, uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of discussion, a lot of conversations, and they were going to need, uh, some of them at least, were going to need to change some of their reporting in their, uh, in their admissions processes, some of what they collected and asked for as students. But we would have some data and be able to flag uh, uh, veterans and other military-connected military students in our, uh, beginning with our fall 2016 enrollment and 2015-16 uh, end-of-term files. And we've decided that we would be able to identify uh, uh, veterans, active duty, uh, military spouses and dependents, and of course non-military uh, connected students. So we've now been through uh, two years of, uh, of data collection. We're very excited and pleased with uh, what the institutions have been able to do. Again, I know we're uh, 
We're certainly conscious of the fact that some changes in uh, admissions systems, processes were required. We're grateful for all the work that went in there. We've got 37 institutions that report data through report student data through our MSAS system, and 35 of them were able to report data on military connected students. And we discovered that in, uh, in fall 2016 and 17, for uh, uh, institutions that were able to report and flag veterans in both years, we had about 35,000 veterans in active duty military uh, across those two years, or about 6% of our uh, total records. And by comparison, I think I'll say here, I'll add that when we were looking at only FAFSA data, we were coming up with a, uh, we were coming up with a ratio of about 1% to 2%, I believe. So we've been able to, to greatly expand uh, uh, what we've been able to look at. We've got another uh, 16,000, as it says on your screen there, uh, military spouses and dependents. So this is all good news, and we are ready to roll. But. <laughs> There's always a but, isn't there? Um, one of the first things that we wanted to do was to be able to sort of uh, to cross tab uh, what we knew about veterans from our newly collected or newly enhanced student level data, as well as what we knew from our um, uh, from the old FAFSA data. And again, we know there are some issues with who who did and didn't report the FAFSA data. But what you can see here on screen is that, for example. Uh, in our MSAS, uh, in our FAFSA veteran data, about um, 151 students uh, reported that they were veterans and 426 reported that they were not. And all of those students were reported as uh, veterans in our MSAS student data. So we've got 426 students who flagged the veteran indicator or rather uh, who were reported as veterans in our MSAS data, but were reported as non-veteran in the FAFSA data. And, and there, are some reasons, there are some other reasons for that that, uh, that we'll get to here. But this was certainly a, uh, we were hoping for some consensus across the data sources, and we got some, but, uh, but we didn't get, but we have some limitations here. This just looks at the same, uh, the same data from the other perspective here. We've got uh, about, let's see here, we've got about uh, 525 students, if I can do math on the fly, who reported that they were active duty in our uh, MSAS data. And of those, about 496 reported that they were not, about 29 reported that they were in the, uh, in the FAFSA data. And we know there are some reasons for this. Again, I mentioned the fact about the, you know, the filing status of some, uh, some students who are receiving post-9-11 GI data. We also, if you dig into the documentation, we also know that there are some differences in terms of what we asked for and in terms of what FAFSA asked for in terms of um, Guard and Reserve students. We are um, we are interested, I think, at the state level in terms of, of looking at the progress and, uh, and retention completion studies of students who have had uh, uh, military training, military experience. We therefore asked for uh, the institutions, and we came to consensus that we would code national, that we would code students who were, uh, who were in the guard along with active duty. We also know that, of course, over the last 15 years, that many guard and reserve um, folks have been uh, deployed to the point that we've uh, we've really blurred the lines between the, the guard and reserve and the active duty military. So we know that's uh, a source of uh, of difference between what we've got what we've got between uh, what we've got in our own state level data, what we've got with facet data that we're going to have to. Uh, uh, make some decisions going forward about how to, uh, how to handle from a research perspective. All of that said, who are our military connected students? We've just begun looking at some of their uh, uh, demographics. We can look at, for example, uh, of course, basics such as gender and race ethnicity for those students in comparison to some of our other folks. This is another interesting slide, too, that tells you something about the uh, cumulative training and uh, or cumulative transfer, rather, excuse me, and uh, distance learning hours that uh, 
some of the uh, active reservists and, uh, and veteran students have, uh, have brought to higher education. We're, we're interested in looking at uh, the extent to which uh, distance education especially can, uh, can help these students to the extent to which their profile might be different than, uh, than the rest of our student population. So what do we have to do then? First of all, we're going to continue to clean and, uh, and validate the data. I mentioned that we're going to, and we've begun thinking about how best to, uh, to count students in various, uh, for various purposes where uh, FAFSA and MSAS data conflict. What are veterans studying? We did some interesting uh, analysis of that uh, for our um, uh, in terms of our first two years of data. And we found out that the, the top majors among uh, veteran and active duty students were our uh, liberal arts and general studies, which of course is an, an, a, an AA transfer degree uh, primarily, business administration, management and operations, criminal justice, which certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, we know that many veterans go and, uh, and, and track into law enforcement. Uh, computer systems, networking, and telecommunications. We know there's some very good training in that area available in the military. This one was interesting to me as well. Our, uh, our number five actually on the list of most popular majors is research and experimental psychology. And we know that this comes from uh, one institution in particular that offers this program and, uh, and is, uh, is certainly catering to a veteran and uh, active duty population. So we're excited and interested in learning more about that. Um, comparative persistence, including a, a subgroup analysis, we will be very careful with this as well because we know that there are some uh, some elements outside of, uh, of veteran military connected students' control related to uh, uh, geographic transfer deployment that cause them to uh, uh, to perhaps. Uh, uh, swirl more among institutions than other students to have additional gaps in their enrollment. So we want to be careful with how we present this data, but it certainly is something that we wanted to be able to take a look at. And we are able to see some differences in persistence between veteran active and, uh, and non-military data, um, uh, non-military students rather. Um, you know, certainly a, a significant difference there already in just the two years of data that we've got. So I, as I hesitate to put some of that data out there too specifically yet because I know there are a lot of caveats around it that we need to, uh, to think about how best to present. But it's certainly, I think, precisely the sort of thing we were hoping to be able to quantify when we began collecting this data. Um, finally, of course, uh, just a... Uh, Questions, questions, questions. We knew that, uh, uh, that, that going into this, that many questions were being raised about uh, who veterans were in higher education, what they were studying, how they were persisting. We look forward to addressing those. We have an administration here in Missouri that is, uh, is very interested in uh, uh, veterans' progress, and we look forward to uh, working with them as well. And uh, with that, I think, I believe, I can uh, pass it along to Rachel. Thank you, Jeremy. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I want to um, say that I know a lot of you are coming from different points of uh, view where you work on this, these issues, whether you're at the institution level or the state level. And having been at but and David just gave us some really good information on very specific at one university. and. And Jeremy gave us a nice uh, bird's eye view at the state. I'm going to talk maybe in a way that addresses both of those issues or both of those vantage points um, about then, but specifically uh, sort of how where Iowa is and, and my role right now in the state of Iowa on these issues. So in 2014, our governor and our legislature uh, passed and signed the Home Base Iowa legislation, which was focused on uh, serving veterans and and getting making Iowa a place that veterans would either come back to if they were from here or even just move, migrate to when they do separate from the military. So there were a lot of different pieces in that. And I, I mention it because it, it's the timeliness of it in relation to our engagement with the MEC grants and the MCMC work uh, being so simultaneous. And while that was sort of just a, a lucky happenstance, um, it really created some 
fortuitous moments for us to sort of connect some pieces a little bit and, and ensure that we were engaging in a statewide conversation that, that hit across multiple levels uh, on behalf of veterans, um, family members, um, and even active duty. So what we did as part of the MCMC work is really seek cross-sector participation. In Iowa, the Board of Regents is, is only our our uh, bachelor's degree and, and graduate level institutions, so the University of Iowa, Iowa State University, and the University of Northern Iowa. So we knew that you can't do this work effectively unless you're working with community colleges and private institutions. There are 33, I believe, private institutions scattered all throughout the state, many of them in our small towns. Uh, we also have, of course, um, for-profit institutions that are serving veterans. And so we knew that the cross-sector um, approach was going to be really important if we were going to do this work well. Uh, and all of our institutions have been very open to engaging in this work in a very cross-sector way. It has not been territorial, which has been a really a delightful aspect of this. We also um, are working on, I wouldn't say that we've done um, as much as we could, but we're working on collaborating with our Iowa Association for College and Military Educators. Um, and the folks that represent that, they do and have been for some time doing different types of work in the space to support veterans. And we want not so much to do the same thing or to sort of um, mix our work a lot, but we want to make sure it complements each other. And so we're trying to find new ways that we can engage across groups of people who are working on these issues. And then, of course, um, transfer issues become really important. Um, for all students and particularly also for veterans, many of whom are coming to us with credits um, transferring from other institutions they've enrolled in or based on their military service. So we've been looking at all of those issues through our work. Um, what's been effective in that effort is bringing in experts um, in part. When, when we have folks from ACE or folks from institutions or states where they're doing really, really well, at certain aspects of this, and we bring them in, and often that's been maybe in a specific discipline. Um, they, they have an ability to give us credibility with certain sets of faculty um, that has been really effective. And so as we do this work, that's been useful. Um, and bringing even just, again, this cross-institutional um, faculty together um, institutionally um, focused on sort of each individual university, certainly of, of, uh, in the Re Board of Regents realm, but others as well. I know they've created committees of faculty and staff um, and that have done some fantastic work. Um, it is not easy to um, track and sort of calculate what all that is and, and the cumulative impact of all that work, but it is incredibly valuable and it's localized and so it can immediately touch those students and those veterans that need that support. And then hearing from our peers. So webinars like this are useful, um, engaging in phone calls, hey, I heard something great is going on in Michigan, I'm going to call Katie Giardello, whatever. Those, are, those have been really valuable things for us to be able to engage with, with other states as well. Um, so what's vexing us? And so I think part of the point of this webinar is to talk about where are the issues and where does institutional research sort of serve a role in helping. Um, using the data on the institutional level, like David shown, showed, is very, again, it has that immediacy of being able to support a veteran in that moment. Um, and, and being able to do that requires a lot of back-end effort in terms of the coding and the tracking, um, much like what Jeremy was talking about at the state level. However, there's a bit of a vacuum um, in Iowa, much as maybe used to be the case in Missouri and many other states. Um, and the definitions are not, even when there is a definition, it's not always terribly clear. So we've had to do some work and we're continuing to embark on this work. Um, at a state level, working with our Department of Education and others in conjunction with this home-based Iowa legislation um, to make sure we have the definition right. Um, they did codify a definition back in 2014, um, but we're not sure it's got all the right nuances in it, and we probably aren't really including, our tent isn't maybe big enough yet um, as we think about that. And so while we look at these reports and we count numbers based on the definition we have, um, I continue to believe that one of our, one of our concerns should be getting, getting that definition right, which sort of feels like it's in the weeds and not, it's not as exciting for some people to engage in that conversation, but we're trying to push along with that. Um, many of you would experience this, and we see this through the data, is a misalignment of licensing and credentialing standards 
with um, either what universities and colleges are offering or with what military training includes. And so we're trying to look at the ways that these things can be lined up um, and where maybe the licensing board is the one that we need to talk to about changes. But it's really being able to try to get some of that uh, data in those different areas and lay it down side by side to, to make those decisions. Um, and it's a little, I think, philosophically vexing at times to think about it because the GI Bill, which is a massive funding element of, for many of these students, um, really, when it was created, had a particular purpose around smooth, you know, controlling entry into the workforce so that there weren't hundreds of thousands of, of uh, young men entering the workforce all at once. That would have been sort of a crisis moment. And the GI Bill was a way to show appreciation as well as to sort of stem that tide. However, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the recent generation, it really the purpose of the GI Bill um, and related programs is really to speed up that process. Um, we don't have the same sort of volume issue to deal with. And so, um, you know, I think when we look at this data, sometimes we look at it from the perspective of, of what's the purpose of doing this. And, what, and I think we have to think about the competing goals there are sometimes, showing appreciation, giving veterans a lot of flexibility in how to complete an education and, and get credit for the hard work um, and training that they've had. On the other hand, speeding the, you know, it's, it's complicated. And so I think um, I bring that up simply because I think it helps us conceptualize what the right solutions are if we understand why some of these things are um, seem conflicting at times. So what should I do? Um, I mentioned already refining the data definitions. I can't say enough how important I think that is. Um, and then building in those tracking mechanisms. So when I look at what Missouri has done, I think that that's really exciting and, and a great development. And I hope Jeremy gets the last two so he can say 37 of 37 um, someday. But I know that there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, on the campus level, getting all of that implemented and systematically tracked in, in an SIS, making sure your business intelligence tools that are reporting on this are doing their job the way David described on an institution level to help him and his colleagues be able to do the sort of spot checking and, and uh, immediate outreach to students. But then globally also being able to connect into things like the National Student Clearinghouse data sets um, and, and using that to help us think at a policy level about these issues. And so building the tracking mechanisms, no matter what your vantage point is um, sitting there today, I think is really important in thinking about it. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that. Um, we do a lot of tracking um, in different ways and for different reasons. And to be able to say, you know, there are this many more than there were last year or this many fewer. But I also think we need to think about the, what are the research questions. And, and I turn to my IR colleagues um, for that quite often to think about not just tell me the number of X. I, I also want to think about, well, what do we really want to understand about X and, and those experiences and how we need to think about that? Because that really is where we can translate into sort of system level or state level meaningful changes if we can think about um, what, what's going on um, in a deeper way and really assessing that. So um, if we can do that kind of research, then it's incumbent upon the IR folks and, and those with whom they work to communicate about where the policy gaps are, where, where we've got issues with articulation or completion or where there's a misalignment that, that needs to be fixed. And I think if we're not going to be more intentional about getting the data clean enough and present enough to do some research, some real research on it. Um, I don't think we're yet even still going to get to a place where we're properly um, putting up a framework for, for veteran student success, um, or any student success sort of writ large, we need to do that. But I think veterans specifically, there is, there is not enough um, effort being put into the research on that. And a lot of it has to do with our, our quality of our tracking and our data on that front. So, um, I'm turning it back over to our moderator, I believe, at this point. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the uh, comments we have uh, that popped up in the feedback is uh, a comment that says, for tracking data for an umbrella effect, you could have any individual receiving VA benefits 
doesn't matter if it's chapter 30, 31, 33, 35, 1606. You can track the subsets of which chapter or if they are a vet or dependent of a vet. And this can include a separate tracking of vet services not using educational funding as well as if school has help for vets outside of VA benefits um, that they're certifying. So thank you for that. Um, Jeremy, David, um, any comments on that? This is Jeremy. I'll just say we kind of we had. Uh, oh, sorry, David. I was just to say that we had a, a similar conversation about this in Missouri. I think, and it's something that maybe someday we'll come back to. We talked about uh, whether uh, uh, using whether using benefits might be a uh, one of the triggers for folks to report uh, uh, veteran status in our data or whether we should just have a separate field or column in the data that related to, regardless of how they self-identified, whether they were using the benefits. And I think that uh, we, we, we wanted to cast as wide a net as possible, but at the same time we had a bit of a, uh, you know, we have a vendor-built system, so we had to think in terms of, uh, you know, costs in terms of the, uh, the modifications that we were able to make uh, at that time. But it's certainly something that I think is a, is a really interesting dimension and something that, uh, uh, that we may come back to down the road. Uh, David? Uh, yeah, at Iowa, well, we don't have a vendor system, which is to our advantage because we can kind of make our system as, as we need it. And we do, in fact, uh, track the VI uh, benefit by chapter as well. Uh, and we also, of course, track those veterans that do not have uh, VA benefits as well because there are other benefits that we can offer them. In addition to that, by tracking the chapter, you know, quite often uh, uh, a student veteran will change benefits maybe halfway through their college career. They might be in the guard at one point getting 1606, and then they get deployed, and then they're eligible for another chapter. And we track that those changes as well. Um, and the other thing that we put into that subset is we also allow the veterans to uh, track what field they were in, whether they were deployed in Iraq or they were deployed in Afghanistan or wherever, that allows us to create yet another subgroup um, as well. And if I David, could this is jump Sarah. in. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. No, no, no. I that's just okay. wanted to quick. Um, go ahead, go no, ahead. You go, Sarah. No, all right, I'll just, I'll go. So I was just going to quickly say that you I go. think what I'm hearing also from my, commu my community college colleagues in Iowa are also telling me there um, is no shortage of veterans who are um, opting to not use their benefits at the community college level because they, want, they, they know that maybe they only have a certain amount available and they want to save that for when they transfer to one of our other universities. And so I think by, if we restricted it to only counting by benefits usage and, and the, the funding sources, I think we would lose some services to people that need it. And so that from, from the state of Iowa, I know that's one of the things that we're trying to be really careful about. And we just received a comment um, on our feedback uh, box. It says the Department of Education has been a petition to uh, create a military connected um, identifier. Uh, definitely needs a military connected student identifier for research and that of course helps with funding. Um, David, one of the questions that I have, you kind of kind of reminded me when you said that um, uh, you were talking about the system that you use. Uh, what program do you use to create or run those fabulous reports that you're able to look at on a daily basis? Um, well, we have uh, several different uh, reporting tools. The ones that I showed you on our slides is running off of uh, SQL Reporting Services, and uh, that basically looks at our uh, homegrown system every night, and uh, it gets refreshed on a nightly basis and populates what we call the student warehouse. And uh, those reports that you saw in these slides uh, draws directly from that warehouse database. Um, the other okay. reporting tool that we use for more visual analysis is a, a software called Tableau. And uh, we've been finding that very beneficial for when you're trying to explain a piece of data to whether it's another government official or an elected body. 
uh, it allows you to visually articulate what's going on, and uh, we found that that software, Tableau, has been pretty good with that. Good, thank you. And uh, Jeremy, um, quick question. You are collecting some amazing data um, for the state of Missouri. Do you know about when you'll be able to uh, share that and make that public? Well, I think it's just it, it was interesting what Rachel said about the research questions as well too. I mean, I think that the that the data are uh, are coming in and are in good shape. There are a couple of institutions that I'd like to kind of follow up with, but uh, but the data are coming in uh, as uh, uh, you know as, as sort of well well populated and 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 completely and thoroughly reported as we could have hoped. So now I think it is a matter of us. Uh, spending a little time stepping back and thinking a little bit more about some of the research questions that we would like to answer. And, uh, and I think we're looking forward to doing that over the course of the, uh, of the coming year. This is certainly, I'll, I'll, I'll say too that, uh, that uh, this is certainly a population that we're interested in within the context of uh, being interested in adult learners as well. It's just, there's, you know, we keep hearing, uh, about the population of uh, the number of high school graduates in Missouri, similar to uh, to many Midwestern states. So if we're going to move the needle on uh, educational attainment, I know many of our surrounding states have a you know a big goal similar to those that were inspired by the Lumina Foundation a, a couple of years ago. And if we're going to get there, we're going to need to do more than uh, than serve uh, you know traditional full-time students. And I think this is an important dimension of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one of our, our participants um, uh, asked, is uh, anyone um, really tracking the large number of, of veterans uh, dependents who are making up a large portion of the students on our campuses using maybe benefits that were uh, transferred to them by their uh, veteran parent or through a version of the GI Bill? Um, Jeremy, um, David, Rachel, any thoughts on that? So this is David at Iowa. We do track those. Um, the, they're called TOEs for transfer of eligibilities. They could also be Chapter 35s, the dependent of a deceased or disabled vet. Those are all tracked. And we also track dependents of veterans that are not currently using GI Bill benefits. Uh, one, because we want to include them into our community and uh, we like to get them to work together with the veterans because they understand that lifestyle, uh, being a dependent of a veteran. Um, so we do track those numbers as well, and uh, yes, they are really high. And one of the interesting things about the dependence of veterans, specifically transfer of eligibilities, is we've seen uh, uh, a change, right? When this, when this chapter GI Bill 33 came out, it was mostly male dominated. And uh, as uh, more and more dependents are using it, what we saw was a flip right around 2008, 2009. Uh, more and more uh, females were using the, the transfer of eligibility benefits and that number has increased steadily. And that is probably the fastest growing uh, cohort within our system right now is the transfer of eligibilities and they're mostly women. And how would you track those folks if they're not um, identifying as dependents uh, on any benefits? If they're not identifying themselves as a dependent, as I stated earlier, we when they go to apply to the University of Iowa, they have the ability to check that they're a dependent of a veteran. It doesn't care whether or not they're using uh, benefits at that point. We just want to know if they're a dependent of a veteran. So we have all that data from the start. Very good. Jeremy, Rachel, anything to add? No, I likewise for Missouri. Mean... Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I, a few of the, yeah, that's okay. A few of the um, comments I'm seeing too. Uh, Dennis, I sympathize with what's going on in Wisconsin in terms of how these things are conflated. Um, I think that's really common. Um, and certainly something that we, that's part of why I want to really address the definition of veteran, the way the state of Iowa is working with it, is this conflation issue. So um, 
haven't solved it yet, but we're trying to solve for it at this time. At least the recognition of the problem is, is present. And in terms of the, there's a question about sort of qualitative studies that might help with some of these definitions. And I think that'd be really valuable. And I think there are some bits and pieces like that out, out there. Um, and focus, again, focus attention on doing more of that kind of work. And, but then doing the study is great. Um, it has to get into the right people's hands to really drive the change that's, that's needed to help with with our problems at hand. So I do, if you know where those studies are um, and, and more folks start using them, that's really, that's the rub right there. And Jeremy, were you going to add something? Um, I was, but I think uh, David covered it. I think that, uh, you know, okay. we do, track dependence out of uh, admissions as well as one of the things that we encourage the uh, institutions to look at if they weren't already. So, uh, you know, given the, the vagaries sometimes of self-reported data, that is something that we're able to do regardless of whether or not they're using their benefits. And we think as well that that's, a, that's an interesting and important cohort going forward. Mm -hmm. We also have um, a comment in our box. Um, most services to help students complete a degree um, for example, tutoring, success counselors, coaches, academic advisors, et cetera, exist at our colleges. And how do we use this data to not duplicate services, but to help give focused efforts to veterans to help make, the, make sure that they're connected to these existing resources? Well, uh, this is David at Iowa. We hired um, a retired Chapter 31 counselor he works uh, 20 hours in our office. And it's kind of a, a cradle to grave uh, mentality. Um, he's very much uh, initially in on it when a student comes in and when they apply. Uh, he is part of that early orientation for veterans and dependents of veterans. He is the one that teaches this class up in Lake Okoboji to these students. And he helps them formulate uh, a strategy for a career afterwards when they get out of college. And within their senior year, when they've applied to graduate, he gets that list and he knows uh, what their major is, he knows whether or not they are uh, likely going to graduate, and he actually goes out and he makes uh, connections to both the private sector as well as within the government for jobs that are looking for people in these fields. And he will connect these up, connect these students up with these uh, hiring entities, and uh, he will help them uh, teach them how to interview. He'll teach them how to create their resume to look correctly, and uh, it's it's really a cradle to grave uh, service that I don't really think uh, is a duplication of anything else that is happening for these student vets. If there are, it's it's in the background, and we're not seeing it. Okay. Um, looking at external uh, sources uh, to identify veterans, um, are there any external sources of data that uh, to identify veterans or dependents who would be eligible for benefits, but they aren't currently using them? Um, well, I mean, we know who uh, is eligible for benefits when they uh, bring in their certificate of eligibility. And our report will tell us when they decide not to use them. Uh, one of your, uh, somebody mentioned earlier that oftentimes uh, people will save their benefits when they're going to community colleges and use them when they go on to uh, a university that's more expensive. We see that too, only we see that from the level of, well, I can take out a student loan in my undergraduate because that's pretty cheap, but I want to go to law school and that's going to be really expensive. So oftentimes they'll save their GI Bill for a professional school or a grad school. And uh, we're able to track that as well. And this is one thing that I, I just wanted uh, to bring up. I know that we the, the focus of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact and the Multi-State Collaborative for Military Credit. Our main focus, of course, is um, military-connected students in higher education, post-secondary ed. 
Um, but then there's also the children of the veterans that um, also need to um, have some attention paid to, paid to them as well. And there's actually an organization called Military Child Education Coalition, and they essentially focus on what we focus on, except at that K through 12 level. And then um, MEC MCMC does the um, post-secondary ed piece. But they have a wonderful website. Um, we've had many conversations with them. Uh, but they, uh, again, it's a military child education coalition. And again, uh, a great uh, resource for anything related to K-12 uh, students of uh, the folks who are in the military. Another question that we have is, um, have they cross-checked the voluntary checkbox and the number of students using vet military benefits? So has there been a cross-check done uh, with those numbers? Has there been a what done with those numbers? Ha have you cross-checked those numbers? Um, so the folks who have checked the, uh, once they check the voluntary box on, um, uh, their application, I'm assuming, and then connect, uh, look at the, the numbers of uh, veterans who are using military benefits. Are you looking at those numbers to see um, how they compare and how they connect? We do, um, and it's, it's, uh, all, it's pretty easy to draw the lines to those um, because we will see uh, when a student initially comes and they uh, go ahead and hit that flag that they're a veteran, all that we know is that they have self-reported that. Once that student uh, comes in, whether they are dependent of a veteran or a veteran, uh, we have a flag that is basically a verifying flag, right? So if a student comes in and says, this is my DD-214, uh, they get another checkbox in the data, which is a verified veteran flag. Uh, if they're a veteran of a dependent, if they come in with a certificate of eligibility, then we know that, okay, not only are they a dependent of a, uh, of a veteran, but we also know that they're receiving benefits off of those as well. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty easy to track. Um, I, I think at Iowa, you know, if you counted all of the, uh, the veterans and dependents of the veterans, uh, including both those using benefits and not using benefits, somewhere around the area of 17, 1800. Um, and within that, how many of those are using benefits? Generally between five and 600 in the falls and spring semester. So those are, those, that's kind of the ratio that we're at. Very good. Um, another thing, you know, we're talking about data and trying to get a snapshot of what military-connected students uh, look like. I can't um, recommend enough the uh, Student Veterans of America organization uh, pulled together the National Veteran Education Success Tracker Report, INVEST. Amazing data is in there. And we actually have uh, two webinars that are archived um, on the MCMC webpage at MEC. Uh, that Dr. Chris Kate, who authored those, those two studies, uh, presented information on for us. Um, just fabulous information, and again, it really hits home um, how many folks are taking advantage of this, and really, um, you know, what a good job our institutions and um, the veterans and students are doing in the areas of post-secondary education. So if you're interested in more information, I would definitely check out that INVEST report. Um, we also have a note that says the Campus Veterans Centers can also assist, so please make sure that you keep um, those in the back of your mind when you're uh, thinking about um, ways to help those military-connected students on your campus. Any other questions or comments? I guess I would just make one more comment. I probably forgot to cover it. When we do get <clears throat> veterans in with benefits, one of the first things we tell them is whether they think they're going to need it or not to apply for financial aid. 
<clears throat> and the reason we do this is because everybody knows that the VA is very punctual sending checks out, right? And um, <laughs> <clears throat> when the usual happens and the, uh, the VA is like six weeks late, you know, nine times out of ten, the student has a landlord that's, you know, harping on them for rent. And uh, as long as they've applied for a student financial aid, uh, that gives us the tools to go ahead and give them immediate assistance through our financial aid office. Even if they didn't accept a loan, just the fact that they've done the paperwork helps them do that. So I would uh, <clears throat> advise any college person who is uh, dealing with student veterans to encourage them to apply for the student aid for that reason. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, any closing thoughts? Just that we are looking forward to uh, continuing to uh, dig into this, defining the research questions, figuring out uh, uh, what we can know about the, 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 the persistence and completion of these students, the, uh, you know, what majors they're studying. Actually, didn't mention workforce follow-up, but that's another area that we're spending a lot more uh, time and energy on in response to requests and questions, and veterans certainly fit in there as well. And just uh, as a closing thought that I've just enjoyed working with and talking to and uh, learning from such a terrific panel. So thank you all. Great. Right. Thank you so much. And Rachel, thoughts, comments? No, much like Jeremy, I appreciate uh, that the topic is being discussed and the thoughtful questions posed um, from participants. So thank you. And um, thank you all. As you know, um, we, we have uh, so many questions to ask and answer uh, regarding military connected students. Um, so there's always more work to be done. Uh, we do have one final question. Um, just to boost the population, is anyone capturing ROTC scholarship students? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, David, Jeremy? Um, we just started doing that this semester actually. Um, that was one of the things we knew was floating out there. Um, we decided to include them into the, the cohort, and uh, this spring is the first year we're tracking that. Okay. And we have another one here. It says, um, I believe numbers of dependents attending is rising, but I do not know the rate of the increase of dependents attending um, higher education. Um, does anybody have any ideas on um, what this rate or what these numbers might look like? You mean nationally or? Uh, the question is specific, but um, if you could give us nationally or, you know, ballpark Iowa, that, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is nationally. I can tell you that um, from the start to where we are now, it's probably tripled for the dependent starting use that mm. the benefits. And it makes sense, right? Because if you think about the time period that we uh, have been fighting these last two wars, um, a lot of those veterans are of that age where their children are just starting to come into college. And uh, we're seeing that more and more. So I think uh, you'll see an influx in, and I think that will continue to be uh, the fastest growing cohort that we see. We've also seen an increase in uh, the Chapter 31s, the disabled vets. That's, there's a lot more of those coming on campus too. So. Okay. Uh, we had mentioned uh, before that we have uh, the web webinars done by Dr. Chris Kate and others um, on our website at MCMC Webinars. Our next one is going to be on Tuesday, February the 20th at 1 p.m. Central Time. And it's State Approving Agencies. And what's that? And it will be presented by Dave Belfi, who is the Director of Education and Employment um, at the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, a lot of folks um, don't realize that State Approving Agencies can be very beneficial um, in gleaning data to help them on their campus. So Dave is going to talk about what data they have and um, how, how can they go about um, approaching them for access. You can join our conversation on Facebook. 
And if you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, contact me, uh, Sarah Appel, at S-A-R-A-A -A at Thank you so much. Have a good day.